Thank you. Sleeper, awake. There are worse insults than being called a sleeper. Yes, sloth is one of the seven deadly sins, but when I saw sloth portrayed on stage in a performance of Christopher Marlowe's play, Dr. Faustus, it was hard to see what was so deadly about it. The other sins, pride, greed, lust, they looked ugly. But sloth, a young girl, came onto the stage, stretched, yawned, and then lay down. The audience relaxed with her. What harm is there in a catnap? Why has the church classified sloth as a deadly sin? We don't hold someone blameworthy for being anemic or for not taking his five-hour energy drink every five hours. But drowsiness is culpable in certain situations. None of us wants our pilots flying or falling asleep at the wheel. Yet sloth is not mere sleepiness or laziness, but rather what Dorothy Sayers rightly identifies as a spiritual condition. She says, it's the sin that believes in nothing, enjoys nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and remains alive only because there is nothing for which it will die. If the besetting sin of modernity is pride, and inordinate confidence in know-it-all reason, then perhaps that of postmodernity is sloth, a relativistic indifference to truth. Someone who believes in nothing and lives for nothing might as well be asleep. Sloth is thus the ultimate sin of omission. Sloth sits still, unmoved by anything real. Sleeping through a movie may not be deadly, but sitting on your hands when the cinema is burning it certainly is. We have to guard against sloth, the temptation to be lulled to sleep when there's something urgent to be done. Is there a cure for this spiritual narcolepsy? There is. G.K. Chesterton says of Thomas Aquinas, the great medieval theologian, that when he was troubled by doubt, he chose to believe in more reality, not less. I think Aquinas has a kindred spirit in C.S. Lewis. Lewis experienced a powerful awakening and afterwards did everything he could to stay awake, by which I mean spiritually alert to the opportunities and dangers that attend the Christian life. For Lewis, waking is a way of describing conversion, a coming to new life. And the Christian life is all about wakefulness. Theology describes what we see when we are awake, and discipleship is about staying awake. The sad truth is many of us are at best only half awake. We think we're engaged with the real world, you know, the world of stock markets, stock car racing, stockpiles of weapons, but in fact we're living in what Lewis calls the Shadowlands. We think we're awake, but we're really daydreaming. We're sleepwalking our way through life asleep at the wheel of existence, only semi-conscious of the eternal, the things that are truly solid that bear the weight of glory. We want to believe the Bible. We do believe the Bible. We confess the truth of its teaching and we're prepared to defend it. But all too often we find ourselves unable to see our world, our lives in biblical terms. And that produces a feeling of disparity an existential disconnect. If faith's influence is waning, as two-thirds of Americans apparently now think, then it's largely because of a failure of the evangelical imagination. We're suffering from imaginative malnutrition. So we typically associate sleep with dreaming and the imagination with daydreaming, but what if what we normally assume to be wakefulness is a kind of sleep? Listen to this letter penned by Lewis in 1963 to one of his correspondents, a, a hospital patient at the time, weighed down with worries of her mortality. Lewis writes her, think of yourself as a seed, patiently waiting in the earth, waiting to come up as a flower in the gardener's good time, up into the real world, the real waking. 
I suppose that our whole present life, look back on from there, will seem only a drowsy half-waking. We are here in the land of dreams, but the cock crow is coming. If conversion is the moment of awakening to the reality of God, discipleship is the effort we must make to stay awake. Waking and sleeping often figure in Lewis's stories at important moments. Do you remember the scene in the silver chair when the queen of Underland is holding Jill, Eustace, and Puddleglum captive in her subterranean lair? The queen tries to convince them that there is no world outside her cavern. She creates an atmosphere thick with drowsy smells, soft music, and then, like the serpent in the garden, she lies through her teeth. There is no land called Narnia, she says. Puddleglum protests that he has come from up there, and the witch makes the idea seem ridiculous. Is there a country up among the stones and mortars of the roof? So the others begin to succumb to the spell, the spell, and Jill says, no, I suppose that other world must be all a dream. Yes, said the witch, there never was any world but mine. And then Jill remembers the last of her waking strength, Aslan. But the witch responds that the lion is only a big cat. And look how you can put nothing into your make-believe world, she says, without copying it from the real world, this world of mine, which is the only world. So just before they all nod off for good, Puddleglum does something that makes Marsh Wiggles everywhere proud. He stamps his foot in the fire, and that clears his head sufficiently for him to give the following speech. Suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things, trees and grass and sun and Aslan. Suppose we have. Then all I can say is, in that case, the made-up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. I'm going to live as like a Narnian as I can, even if there isn't any Narnia. Those who follow Jesus Christ have been similarly jolted awake, not by stamping feet in the fire, but by having to send on them tongues of fire. Remember the words of John the Baptist, I baptize, baptize you with water, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The Spirit of Christ burns in our hearts, awakening us to the presence and activity of Jesus Christ. Sleeper awake. The full quotation comes from the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 5.14. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Lewis wants us to wake up, to live not in the shadowlands, but in broad daylight, and he thinks the imagination can help. So this is our challenge, to understand how Lewis enlists the imagination in the cause of wakefulness rather than daydreaming. Christianity has nothing to do with make-believe or wish fulfillment. There's nothing romantic about crucifixion, nothing more nitty-gritty than nails piercing flesh, nothing airy-fairy about bodily resurrection. I'm a theologian, but I'm the least superstitious person you'll ever meet. I'm a realist. I believe the world to be independent of what I think about it. But I'm also convinced that preachers and theologians minister reality. The question is, what's the nature of reality? How can we come to know the truth about what is? Now, Lewis had a high regard for Plato, perhaps because Plato, too, understood that men and women were dwellers in the Shadowlands. His famous myth of the cave suggests that we're all cave men and cave women, prisoners in a dark place, chained so that we see a wall on which are cast the shadows of the things that pass by the cave's mouth. It's actually worse than the witch's underworld because these cave dwellers have never been outside. They have no way of knowing the reality beyond the shadow appearances. In Plato's world, the world that appears to our senses is only a shadow world. We need reason to see with our mind's eye the eternal forms of which things on earth are but pale images. For Plato, reason, not imagination, is the royal road out of the shadowlands into the bright land of reality. 
Karl Marx didn't say sleepers awake, but he did say workers unite. And he too believed that he could lead people out of their industrial caves into the light of communism. Marx also wants us to wake up, but not to Plato's ethereal realm of ideas, but to the material and economic forces that he thinks shape our lives and determine history from below. Marx was suspicious of religion and imagination, and combined, they make up what he called the opiate of the people, because they distract us, lull us with pious fictions, distract us from what is truly real, which in his view is the class warfare that makes the world go round. At the very least, I hope you agree that it's vitally important to wake up to the truth of what's happening in our world. But what is that reality behind the appearances? Is truth above, as Plato thinks, or below, as Marx claims? And is the imagination a hindrance or a help in waking us up to the truth? In responding to this question, we would do well to begin by considering Lewis's own awakening, his conversion to Christianity. Then we'll want to hear what Lewis has to say about the imagination, discipleship, and theology. And after we do that, we'll run a second lap, and uh, this time looking at these things from the perspective of how I employ them in my own work as a theologian. And we'll conclude with some thoughts about how the imagination helps us to answer two questions who Jesus Christ is for us today, and who we are for him. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead. Paul's rousing conclusion to his exhortation to the church of Ephesus is to walk not in darkness, but as children of light. There's this connection between waking and walking. Conversion is like waking, and walking is like discipleship. And we need the light of Christ for both. Paul's describing here in Ephesians the process by which those who were once in darkness come to walk in the light. Lewis's own awakening, or at least the first stage of his awakening, began with what he describes as the baptism of his imagination. As we've heard, as a child, he had moments of joy, intense intimations of something wonderful just beyond his reach, a wood beyond the world's end. But he had become, under the tutelage of his rationalist teachers, an adolescent atheist, a teenage Richard Dawkins. In a letter to Arthur Greaves, he said, I believe in no religion. Religions are mythologies invented to meet our emotional needs. But in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, he explains what happened to him after purchasing George MacDonald's Fantasties at a railway station. When he stepped onto that train, he was a split personality. He said, nearly all I loved, I believed to be imaginary. Nearly all that I believed to be real, I thought grim and meaningless. But as he read McDonald's book later that evening, he experienced a radical makeover. The light of Christ shone on Lewis as he read Fantasties. He wasn't yet at the point of confessing the light as Christ, but whose other embassy could it be? Lewis says he experienced what as a boy he called northernness, a bright shadow, a glimpse of the beauty of another world that awakened a yearning both for the world and for that experience. Here's how he describes reading Fantasties. But now I saw the bright shadow coming out of the book into the real world and resting there, transforming all common things and yet itself unchanged. Or, more accurately, I saw the common things drawn into the bright shadow. This bright shadow was not quite northernness, but otherness. Yet instead of remaining other, the other world leapt out of the story, landing on the Normandy beach of Lewis's imagination, invading his 16-year-old secular consciousness. Now, Fantasties did not convert his intellect, other books did that. But it did insert a new quality into his waking life, holiness. That's the quality Lewis later identified as what he found in Fantasties, a holy northernness, a holy otherness, a quality that refused to remain in the text and instead began to cast a bright shadow over the world in which Lewis lived. 
I saw the common things drawn into the bright shadow. This is the dynamic I'd like us to understand better. For the moment, let's just say that young Mr. Lewis experienced a spiritual awakening. McDonald helped him to see a bright silver lining to earthly clouds, a deeper dimension to ordinary earthly things, a world beyond cold logic and physical matter. The bright shadow and fantasies that so intrigued Lewis turns out to be a supernatural quality of the real universe in which we all live. Thirty years after reading Fantasties, Lewis says this, I've never concealed the fact that I regard MacDonald as my master. Indeed, I fancy I have never written a book in which I did not quote from him. MacDonald even appears as a character in Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. Remember that story? It's about not the the hound of heaven, but the greyhound to heaven, a bus trip from the valley of the shadow of life to the outskirts of heaven. And in that imaginary account of a bus trip, Lewis, a passenger, meets MacDonald, who he casts in the role of his guide to heaven, the Virgil to his Dante. Lewis says that reading Fantasties was the first sight of Beatrice, was like the first sight of Beatrice to Dante, the first glimpse of a new life. So this Christian life is all about waking up and walking out of the shadowlands toward the sun. And Lewis's mention of MacDonald as his Virgil recalls Dante's divine comedy where Virgil, a poet, not a philosopher, is the one who leads Dante farther up and further in. We Protestants have our own version, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. The Christian life is indeed a life of itinerant discipleship, and Lewis's journey began with the baptism of his imagination. Lewis has taught me that the triune God not only baptizes, but also disciples our imaginations. He's persuaded me that the imagination is a vital ingredient in doing theology. Not everyone is is convinced. When in doubt, define your terms. We start with discipleship. Walter Hooper says that Lewis was the most thoroughly converted person he had ever met. Lewis desired above all to submit not only his thought but his whole life to Christ. And some of us may not have sufficiently appreciated the extent to which Lewis was a Christ intoxicated man. It's therefore significant that the opening line of a new work on Lewis by Paul Brazier It's a trilogy, actually. A new work on Lewis, the first line is, this is a book about Jesus Christ. Discipleship is for Lewis the process of becoming Christ-like. God isn't interested in making merely nice people. This is the lie of moral therapeutic deism. God wants to make people perfect, like Christ. Romans 8, 29. God predestined those whom he foreknew to be conformed to the image of his Son. And what interests Lewis is how God translates Christ into ordinary mortals. We may not want to become little Christs, but the Lord will not settle for anything less. Lewis imagines Christ telling his disciples to count the cost of following him. Make no mistake, he says. If you let me, I will make you perfect. The moment you put yourself in my hands, that is what you are in for. And then in one of my favorite quotes from Lewis, he says, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, All the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. And to that list, we can certainly add theology. And speaking of theology, what exactly did Lewis think it was good for? When Sheldon Van Aken wrote, asking whether Lewis thought he should switch from studying English to theology, Lewis replied with some ambivalence, saying, I've always been glad myself that theology is not the thing I earn my living by. The performance of a duty 
will probably teach you quite as much about God as academic theology would do. Ouch. But in fact, Lewis was an amateur theologian in the best sense of the term, someone who does something not to earn one's living, but simply for the love of it and for the love of God. Lewis wrote introductions to theological tomes like Athanasius's On the Incarnation. He depicted doctrines such as creation and the fall and atonement in his fiction and explained nothing less than the doctrine of the Trinity in the radio broadcasts eventually published as Mere Christianity. Think about that, talking about the Trinity on the radio. That's the equivalent of a trapeze artist doing triple somersaults without a net. And here's how Lewis begins. He says, everyone has warned me not to tell you what I am going to tell you. They all say the ordinary reader does not want theology. Give him plain, practical religion. I have rejected their advice, he says. I do not think the ordinary reader is such a fool. Lewis goes on to compare doctrines to maps. Maps help orient us, help us find our way in the real world. And the doctrine of the Trinity maps out, as it were, the life of God. And those complex Trinitarian relations, the Father sending the Son, the Son sending the Spirit, and so on, they're all finally about how God enables us to share in the Son's fellowship with the Father. To share in the Son's life is to have a share in something that was begotten, not made. Something that has always existed and always will exist. Lewis therefore concludes, I warned you that theology was practical. The whole purpose for which we exist is to be taken into the life of God. So what difference does theology make? Just this, it wakes us up to the reality of our sonship, our adoption into God's family, our being in Christ. And theology uses both prayer and poetry to minister this reality. Prayer is a way of discerning and directing the mind to what is ultimately real, our createdness, God's creativity. Lewis writes, the moment of prayer is for me the awareness, the reawakened awareness that this real world and real self are very far from being rock bottom realities. Prayer is the preeminent theological act and disciples do theology when they experience the reality of the relationship to God on their knees. A disciple is one who prays and stays awake. That's easier said than done. While Jesus prayed at the Garden of Gethsemane, reminding himself of what was real and stealing himself to face death and accomplish his mission, while he was doing that, the disciples fell asleep. Jesus found them, reprimands Peter, encouraged him to keep awake and pray. They fall asleep again. Jesus returns. Mark says, they did not know what to say to him. Jesus goes away again, and once more, you guessed it, they fell asleep. By failing to stay awake, they effectively denied their Lord three times. They literally fell asleep. But my concern is that disciples today are metaphorically dozing off, sleepwalking their way through life, and thus missing the bright shadows of eternity in the everyday. The imagination can help. The Socratic Club of Oxford University once asked Lewis to address the question, is theology poetry? Which he took to be asking, does theology owe its attraction to the power of arousing and satisfying the imagination? And if so, are we mistaking aesthetic enjoyment for intellectual assent? Well, says Lewis, if theology is poetry, it's not very good poetry. There's nothing particularly aesthetic about the drunkenness of Noah or the thorn in Paul's flesh. But yes, scripture and theology use figurative language, and Lewis insists we cannot restate our belief in a form free from metaphor. Quote, 
We can say, if you like, God entered history instead of saying God came down to earth. But of course, entered is just as metaphorical as came down. All language about things other than physical objects is necessarily metaphorical. Well, what is metaphor, if not a statement that, taken literally, proves false? What are we to make of Lewis's suggestion in a chapter called Let's Pretend in Mere Christianity that when we pray our Father, we're dressing up as Christ? The answer lies in Lewis's understanding of the imagination, which involves a good pretending, a way of waking up and remaining wakeful to the real thing. But wait a minute. How can imagining that we are something we're not, which is what pretending is, how can that ever help us come to grips with reality? Should it not worry us that the King James Version consistently refers to vain imaginings, or that Genesis 6-5 says, and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, that's a translation. And ironically, a biblical, this mistranslation, or this particular translation, makes us captive to a particular picture of the imagination, as a faculty of producing mental images, often of things that are not there. And some of us have that idea of imagination in mind. We need to move on. Because representing things that are absent or non-existent sounds suspiciously like lying, saying of what is not that it is. On this standard picture, the imagination produces false images, more conducive to idolatry than to theology. Is that what Lewis had in mind, the imagination as in picture-making power? Before I answer that, let's return to George MacDonald, Lewis's master, and see what he had to say about the imagination. MacDonald did one thing Lewis never did. He came to the United States. He went on a lecture tour, which was a huge success. There hadn't been anything like it since Charles Dickens did something similar. And in gratitude for his warm welcome, MacDonald wrote and published in 1878 a letter to American boys. It's a very long letter, but it includes a story, and it begins like this. There was once a wise man to whom was granted the power to send forth his thoughts in shapes that other people could see. I'm pretty sure the power MacDonald is referring to is the imagination, because elsewhere he gives a formal definition. The imagination is that faculty which gives form to thought. When forms embody old truths in new ways, that's what we call the imagination. But if they're simply inventions, lovely but not true, MacDonald calls them works of fancy. And according to MacDonald, creation itself, the world in which we live, is the product of the divine imagination. The world is made up of God's thoughts, put into shapes that people can see. Well, what about Lewis? Did he ever define imagination? As I mentioned, he acknowledges the common use of the term, this faculty for producing images, but he used the term in other ways as well. And Owen Barfield thinks that Lewis never developed an overarching theory of imagination for the simple reason that he wanted to protect rather than subject it to analysis. And this brings us to the distinction between reason and imagination. Reason is the faculty of analysis that maintains objectivity, inspects things, and then breaks them down into their component parts. In his essay, Meditation in a Tool Shed, Lewis contrasts looking at a beam of light with looking along it. Reason remains aloof, maintaining a critical distance from that shaft of light, and so reason only sees the specks and particles of dust swirling in the beam of light. By way of contrast, imagination steps into the beam of light, looks along it, tastes, and participates in its illumination. I wonder if Lewis intends his meditation in a tool shed to be a kind of answer to Plato's myth of the cave. Perhaps. Perhaps. 
Remember, for Plato, the world is full of shadows, appearances, and only reason apprehends the eternal forms. But for Lewis, the world is filled with bright shadows, and it's the imagination that perceives the brightness, this holy otherness in the shadow. Because for Lewis, things on earth are the created form of divine thoughts. Lewis puts it this way. Christianity, he says, is God expressing himself through what we call real things. Fallen human beings both express and ensnare themselves by making false mental images. Our mind's eye suffers from the distortion of the astigmatism of sin. But we should no more hold the imagination itself responsible for making false images then we would hold reason responsible for making logical fallacies. Fancies and fallacies alike proceed from bent hearts, not from the divinely created faculties of imagination and reason. Well, entire books have been written on the relation of reason and imagination in Lewis, and we have time only to ponder one comment. It's another quote from Lewis. He says, for me, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. Imagination, producing new metaphors or revivifying old ones, is not the cause of truth, but its condition. This is something of a hard saying. What's an organ of meaning? I think it has something to do with the capacity not only to liken things, as we heard last night, but also to discover patterns to synthesize things that appear initially unrelated. Reason, analytic reason, excels in taking things apart and examining individual puzzle pieces, but the imagination perceives the whole of which the pieces are apart. Imagination is that power of insight, that eureka moment, when all the parts fall into place transforming something that would otherwise be an incoherent jumble into a meaningful pattern. Metaphor reminds us that the imagination works with verbal as well as visual raw material. Metaphors describe the unfamiliar in terms of the more familiar. Chess is war. That makes us think about the game of chess in terms drawn from military experience. This association of ideas generates meaning and power. In fact, the sociologists George Lakoff and Mark Johnson have written a book entitled Metaphors We Live By. Think about time as money. That's a metaphor that will color the way you live each day. Or if we walk around thinking life is war, that's going to structure our daily experience much differently than if we followed Forrest Gump's life is a box of chocolates, or John Calvin's life is a theater in which to act for God's glory. What metaphors do we live by? One factor that kept Lewis from embracing Christianity initially was his inability to understand what it meant to be saved. In particular, he he could not understand the doctrine of atonement at least not when it was formulated as a doctrine. He didn't know what the doctrine meant. He wrote to his friend Arthur Greaves, you can't believe a thing when you're ignorant of what the thing is. But here's where the imagination, the organ of meaning, comes into its own. The New Testament uses several metaphors to communicate the saving significance of Jesus' death. Sacrifice, penalty, ransom, victory, and others. And Lewis came to understand the doctrine of atonement only when he contemplated it through those metaphors. Metaphors are the building blocks, then, for the house in which we live, the interpretive framework that we inhabit. But the house itself is not metaphor. This honor goes to story and myth. A story is only imagining out loud. And stories, too, are organs of meaning insofar as they can connect the scattered parts of a person's life and transform them into a unity with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Myths are stories, too, but 
What counts is the pattern of events, says Lewis, rather than the telling. Myths do more than communicate ideas. They allow us to see and taste what they are about. This is what so entranced Lewis about stories. They communicate the feel of reality, and when they do, they awaken something deep within us. He says, what flows into you from the myth is not truth, but reality. Truth is always about something, but reality is that about which truth is. We taste the truth when we indwell the story or when the story indwells us. Lewis wrote stories, not so readers could escape, but so they could experience reality. And not its surface either, but its depths. Lewis did not put reason on the side of truth and imagination on the side of falsehood. No, both reason and imagination communicate truth. But analytic reason does it in bits and pieces. The imagination does it by grasping the big picture. In his sermon, The Weight of Glory, Lewis speaks movingly about the desire we all have for something that eludes us. Our experiences of beauty are only the echo of a tune we've not heard, news from a country we've never visited. And in the middle of the sermon, Lewis pauses and asks the congregation, do you think I'm trying to weave a spell? Perhaps I am, but remember your fairy tales. Spells are used for breaking enchantments as well as for inducing them. And you and I have need of the strongest spell that can be found to wake us from the evil enchantment of worldliness. Lewis's imagination is not the opiate of the people. It's a dose of caffeine that snaps us awake. And so are the stories of the Bible. For Lewis, they refer not to non-historical things, but non-describable things. As with metaphor, so with story. We we can't exactly say what it's about apart from the story itself. Lewis says, the doctrines we get out of true myth are, of course, less true. They're translations into our concepts and ideas of that which God has already expressed in a language much more adequate, namely, the actual incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection. Well, Scripture is the story that disciples live by. Scripture tells us the true story of the wood beyond the world where mankind fell, the true story of the Word made flesh who became one of us so that we could become united to Him. And we need imagination to indwell that story, to see and taste and feel the risen one in our midst. So let me restate in my own terms what I think I've learned from Lewis. Theology ministers understanding so that we can live out our knowledge of God. Theology is practical. It's all about waking up to the real, to what is, specifically to what is in Christ. For Christ is the meaning of the whole, the one in whom all things are held together. And disciples demonstrate understanding by conforming to that what is in Christ. It's all about living out our knowledge of Christ because there are no armchair disciples. There's no alibi for discipleship. You can't be a disciple in theory. So doctrines tell us what is in Christ, and that's what we live by, what is in Christ. Incarnation, Trinity, and atonement, they're not abstractions to be thought. They're meaningful patterns to be lived and entered into. And the imagination then helps disciples act out what is in Christ. Theology exchanges the false pictures that hold us captive with truth, disciplining our imaginations with sound doctrine. Discipleship is a matter of the indoctrinated imagination. Now, of course, we have to beware of having our imaginations taken captive by other things, Many of Screwtape's strategies have to do with capturing the imagination for Satan's purposes. If you can control the metaphors and the stories people live by, you've got them. So I want to say from my perch on George MacDonald's shoulders that imagination is the faculty by which God gives created form to his thoughts and literary forms 
to his word. Jesus used what we can call the parabolic imagination to give story form to his thought about the kingdom of God. And similarly, disciples need this parabolic imagination so that we can live in that kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus doesn't describe what the kingdom looks like. He tells us what kinds of things happen there. And the metaphors disciples live by are those that awaken them to the kingdom things God is doing in Christ. I'm haunted by what the sociologist Robert Bella says. The quality of a culture can be changed when 2% of its people have a new vision. Surely we can muster 2%. Unfortunately, if other sociologists are to be, to be believed, an even greater percentage of Christians live by a quite different metaphor, namely the moral metaphor of God as Father Christmas. Moral therapeutic deism indoctrinates its adherents to think of God not as worrying about their sanctification, only whether they've been naughty or nice. It's no good professing to be a Christ follower if your imagination is captive to the image of God as a moral therapist or a celestial handyman whom we call upon only when we have a problem that needs fixing. Lewis likens God by way of contrast to a savage beast, an unhousebroken member of the great cat family to be precise. He is not a tame lion. So the Bible gives us the metaphors and stories disciples are to live by. Some of our congregations have malnourished imaginations. They've been taken captive to culturally conditioned pictures of the good life. And it's difficult in the extreme to connect those pictures with sound doctrine. So we want to believe the Bible, we do believe it, but for the life of us, we're having a hard time relating the doctrine we profess to the lifestyle we practice. We feel this disconnect, and here's where the imagination can help. The imagination wakes us up to the new reality that is in Christ and helps us stay awake. The imagination, I've said, is the synoptic power that relates parts and wholes together. We'll call that the biblical imagination, seeing how everything focuses on Christ. The imagination engages as our will and emotions and not just the mind. Paul may have had the imagination in mind when in Ephesians 1.18 he speaks of having the eyes of our hearts enlightened. The Spirit alone can open the eyes of our heart, but we have to make the effort to keep them open by maintaining our relationship with the object of our heart's desire, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to make two points about the function of the imagination. I can do it in four words with two pairs of ideas. This, that, and present perfect. First, as we've already seen, the basic gesture of the imagination is the invitation to see this as that. It takes imagination to understand how marriage, this, symbolizes the relationship of Christ and his church, that. We have to remember the possibility of false imaginings, evil spells. We mustn't confuse the evangelical what is and what will be in Christ with the satanic what if or what might be apart from Christ. The serpent in the garden played upon Eve's imagination, saying that if only she would eat of the tree, she would be like God. And Satan plays the same what-if game with Jesus, showing him all the kingdoms of the earth and says, if only you will worship me, it will all be yours. And in each case, the what-if held out is a possibility that is false. It would violate the created order and leads to no good at all. The Apostle Paul, though, isn't speaking about what-ifs, but about what is. And theology's task is to say what is in Christ. Paul isn't playing make-believe when he says he's been crucified with Christ. He doesn't say it's as if Christ lives in me. That would be bad pretending. No, Paul says what is in Christ. But it requires a faithful imagination to see that because it's not evident to the senses. I think Lewis had the unique gift about of writing what if in order for us to see what is. 
and what will be in Christ. And this brings me to the second function of the imagination. Not simply this as that, but seeing what is present and partial as future and perfect. It takes imagination to understand Paul when he says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Yes, Paul is a man in Christ, but not the way a shoe is in a shoebox. Paul is in Christ, but as President Clinton puts it, it all depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. And the is of what is in Christ is eschatological. It has to do with tasting now the kingdom of God whose completion remains future. But thanks to the indwelling spirit, disciples already enjoy union with Christ, even though they may not have attained yet full measure of Christ's likeness. As Lewis reminds us, we've never talked to a mere mortal. We can take each other seriously because even the most uninteresting person may one day, he says, be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. So when Lewis speaks of good pretending, it's not the fictive what if, it's the eschatological what is. The naked eye can't see it, but the eyes of the heart see God's transferring saints from the old age to the new, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. So I can state my thesis now. To imagine what is in Christ is not to daydream, but to awake to the day of the Lord. Calvin was right. The scriptures are our spectacles of faith. We must look not simply at the Bible, but along it. The imagination is that way of looking along the Bible, indwelling its stories. When we look along and dwell in the text, we're imagining biblically. We're letting biblical patterns organize our experience. And it's only when we do that that we see ourselves as we truly are. The biblically disciplined imagination enables us to see the world as it truly is. Not a mechanical universe in perpetual motion, but a divine creation in the midst of labor pains where the new in Christ is struggling to come forth from the old in Adam. And doctrine prepares disciples for their vocation, which is not play acting, but rather being real. Disciples are participants in the kingdom of God that's coming in the midst of what is passing away. That's the task of the disciple, to act out the truth of Christian doctrine. And in acting out what is in Christ, we become Christ-like. Let me pull everything together by focusing on one crucial moment in the gospel story, Jesus' transfiguration. Once again, three disciples accompany Jesus to pray. Once again, they fall asleep. And meanwhile, this time, Jesus is transfigured. His clothes become dazzling white, that quality that laundry detergent makers promise but never deliver. His face shone like the sun. What's going on here? Well, here's what Luke says. When they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. There are other accounts of people seeing bright lights and not knowing what to make of it. Think of Paul's companions on the road to Damascus. But when the disciples awoke, they saw something more than normal light. They saw Jesus' glory. But what does that mean? What exactly did they see? What, what does glory look like? I believe they saw the eschatological is. Jesus had earlier in the gospel predicted that some with him would not taste death before they saw the kingdom of God. And this is precisely what his transfiguration shows the disciples, a preview of Jesus' glorious lordship in the age to come. But the disciples also needed a biblically informed imagination to see this as that. And the evangelists go out of their way to make imaginative connections between Jesus' transfiguration and God's appearance to Israel on Mount Sinai in Exodus 24. There are a lot of parallels. 
Both incidents involve clouds, a divine voice, shining faces. And here we catch the theological imagination at work in the connecting of the canonical dots and the forming of the pattern in Christ. Others had seen Jesus and watched him perform miracles, yet they did not know who he was. It takes a biblically disciplined imagination to see Jesus as the summation of the law and the prophets, which is what those two men with Jesus represented. It takes a biblically disciplined imagination to grasp how God is summing up his plan in Christ. Friends, we are those disciples on the mountain with Jesus. We need to awaken to the glory of the transfigured risen Christ in our midst. And we need to stay awake so that we, like the disciples at the end of the story, see no one but Jesus only. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Disciples see the fullness of God in Jesus, not with physical eyes, but with the eyes of the heart. Jesus is the bright shadow, not northernness, but holy otherness in human form, coming out of the good book into the real world and resting there, transforming all common things. And here is the marvel. The one whose story the Bible tells is not confined to that story. He's the Lord, and he is here to see the common things of daily life drawn into the bright shadow of Christ, that's the mark of a well-nourished theological imagination. Towards a conclusion, I can't recall a time when I was not living in or acting out stories. Thanks to Alexander Dumas and Roger Lancel and Green, what would otherwise have been a plain tract of single-family homes was for me a kingdom wherein I could exercise chivalry, rescue fair ten-year-old maidens, defend my honor against the dragon next door, an elderly lady, truth be told. <laughs> and it was the imagination that allowed me to inhabit the worlds of novels like The Three Musketeers or King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. They were very much part of my early education. They gave me not simply abstract principles of behavior, but concrete examples, a taste of what heroism looked like. I knew, of course, that I couldn't really hurt the neighborhood bully, uh, much less run him through with my sword. Still, I look back fondly on the time spent between the covers of books and bedsheets as an important part of my character development. But years later, I discovered C.S. Lewis, and I realized that behind the kingdom I had discovered in Dumas, there was another kingdom, deeper, more compelling, more exciting, and more real, the kingdom of God. And I became a knight of the Lord's table. Final illustration. Two stonemasons were hard at work when asked what they were doing, the first said, I'm cutting this stone in a perfectly square shape. The other said, I'm building a cathedral. I'm building a cathedral. And both answers are correct, but it takes imagination to see that you're building a cathedral when you're simply cutting blocks of granite. Two pastors were hard at work. When asked what they were doing, the first said, I am planning programs, preparing sermons, and managing conflict. The other answered, I am building a temple. It takes the biblical imagination to see one's congregation as a living temple, with each member as a living stone, being worked, chiseled, fitted, polished, in order to be joined together with Christ, the cornerstone of the whole edifice. It takes the eschatological imagination to look 
at a sinner in your congregation and see a saint. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning. Disciples need imagination to stay awake to the reality of what is in Christ. To be in bright shadow is to live in the shadowlands as people whose eyes of the heart have been enlightened, alert to the mystery of grace in the mundane, awake to God in ordinary. Yes, we may live in the shadowlands, but we disciples walk in the light, even as he is in the light. To live as a disciple is to live in the bright shadow of Jesus Christ. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Our Father, illumine us by your Spirit so that the eyes of our hearts may be fully opened so that we can see the brightness of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who is the light the one who enlightens every person coming into the world. May he shine in our minds and in our hearts, and may we be conformed to his image. Lord, make us little lights who shine for Christ in a darkened world. For his sake, amen. Thank you.